Hi there. Thanks so much for joining me. I'm CBS 8's Jenny Day. A lot to get to this week as I fill you in on what happened around San Diego. We'll also take a look at what's to come. We do start, though, at the U.S.-Mexico border, where the clock is ticking on a looming crisis. For more than a year now, we've seen an influx of migrants, but that's only expected to grow with Title 42 set to expire on Wednesday. The border policy, Title 42, sends those who cross illegally right back to their home country without being able to apply for asylum. It was enacted by the CDC under the Trump administration after citing public health concerns right at the start of the pandemic. CBS 8 Shannon Handy has what's being done to prepare here and reaction from two local activists. Title 42 is set to expire on Wednesday and border officials are preparing for an influx of migrants. Right now, more than 2,000 are arriving in El Paso daily. Closer to home here in San Diego, local activists say they too are seeing more migrants, but at this point, it's unclear what will happen to them. This is the scene in El Paso, Texas. More than 7,000 migrants have arrived in the region in just the past three days. Shelters there are full. There isn't a lot of infrastructure for them. They're sleeping out in the cold, freezing weather. Pedro Rios is the director of American Friends Service Committee. The San Diego activist is in El Paso right now to discuss the ongoing issues at the border. He says there's a lot of uncertainty over what will happen once Title 42 expires on December 21st. The pandemic era policy gives the government power to turn away migrants, including asylum seekers, citing the need to prevent COVID-19 from spreading. There's not a lot of information, and this really frustrates and, and makes conditions much more desperate for migrants that are seeking uh, information about how they might apply for asylum. Not only that, but he says the government isn't providing enough resources. Closer to home near San Diego, Enrique Morones, executive director of Gente Unida, says there's also a lack of information and infrastructure. They're looking for shelter wherever they can find shelter. It's similar in many cases in downtown San Diego where you have these houseless people just camping all over the place. Morones worries some migrants are being taken advantage of by people who claim they can help them cross over more easily for money. Like Rios, he too wonders what the Biden administration's plan is come Wednesday. According to the Department of Homeland Security, they have a six-pillar plan, which includes sending more resources to the border, increasing processing efficiency, imposing consequences for unlawful entry, bolstering nonprofit capacity, targeting smugglers, and working with international partners. Meanwhile, 19 Republican-led states have filed an appeal hoping to keep Title 42 in place. A ruling on that is expected before Friday. Earlier this week, a group of GOP lawmakers criticized the Secretary of Homeland Security for his handling of the issue, vowing to impeach him once they control the House next year. He has failed to secure our border and has thus endangered Americans. Shannon Handy, CBS 8. And Governor Gavin Newsom did talk immigration reform at the U.S.-Mexico border this week, but his press office says that meeting didn't happen in California. CBS 8 political reporter Morgan Reiner found out why. The email to the Capitol Press Corps this morning was three sentences long. The governor would be traveling to the U.S.-Mexico border to talk about immigration reform. Now, for a state like California that is home to more immigrants than any other state in the country, this is a critical topic. Now, in a national interview with ABC News, Governor Gavin Newsom said the federal government should be doing more to address the migrant crisis. He said the federal government keeps sending planes and buses to California full of migrants because of all the good work he said the state is doing for the immigrant community, like providing health care. But he says the state is overwhelmed. He said with Title 42 being lifted in just one week, the state will not be able to handle the influx. He said nine shelters along the border are already at capacity. Now, Newsom said this is an issue that needs to be addressed by Republicans and Democrats, but not like how he said Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is doing it by sending immigrants to Martha's Vineyard. Again, the California press was not at this border tour, only national. Political analyst Steve Swat said that was not accidental. He is trying to raise his profile on a national level, and he would like nothing better than to be the firebrand on the left for, for uh, Democrats who was willing to take on Governors DeSantis and Abbott uh, on the immigration issue because it's so important to California in a different way than it, perhaps it's important to those states. Newsom said he would be willing to work with Governors DeSantis and Abbott if they, quote, are willing to put aside their cruelty and their zest for demonization. 
Morgan, thanks, and stay with CBS8.com for developments. Well, the San Diego police officer who was shot in Mountain View Monday is back home with his family. 21 year old Andrew Garcia accused of shooting that officer pleaded not guilty from his hospital room. We are told he was hospitalized after he ingested narcotics and they found him unconscious. Police say Garcia shot the officer after leading them on a chase, then barricaded himself in an apartment for nearly 10 hours. The officer was hit once in the chest and twice in the arm. We are all extremely thankful that the officer survived his injuries and that the prognosis for him is positive. Yeah, Garcia was on felony probation for a previous case and was denied bail. He'll face a judge again on December 23rd. Well, the city of San Diego has given the green light to shift infrastructure funding from wealthy areas to low income neighborhoods. Up until now, the, fee the fees the city collected from developers stayed in the neighborhood where the project happened. The new rules will put the millions of dollars of money from developer fees into one citywide pot. The money will be used for parks, libraries and bike lanes. Projects needed for public safety will be prioritized no matter what neighborhood is needed in. Because there hasn't been a lot of development or investment in the lower income neighborhoods, they've seen a lack of defense. Excuse me here, but yeah, neighborhoods that will benefit from the change include places like Barrio Logan, San Ysidro, and Canto, City Heights, and Navajo. Well, some of the neighborhoods that could lose money are North Park, PB, and East Village. Chula Vista, meantime, will now move forward with renovations for a new art center. The city is allocating millions to remodel the building on 4th Avenue. Those funds were originally intended to be used to help people living on the street or help keep businesses open. In recent years, people have been critical of how Chula Vista has dealt with small businesses and the lack of services for homeless people. Now they are criticizing what they call the misuse of federal funding. Why the extra funding and why weren't people notified of that? Why was it kind of, you know, snuck in on the agenda? Yeah, in a written statement, the deputy mayor said it's an important project and fully support it as art brings pride and honor to the community. End quote. The renovation is planned to start in 2023. And National City is getting a new mayor this week. Longtime council member Ron Morrison will take over for Alejandra Sotelo Solis. CBS 8's Rocio De La Fe sat down with Morrison to talk about his plans and future for the city. Rob Morrison is no stranger to the public eye. The longtime politician served as both council member and mayor in National City before. He says he's ready to take on the big seat once more after winning what was a tight race. December 13th, yes. Ron Morrison is preparing to take his seat as mayor for the fourth time after defeating incumbent mayor Alejandra Soltel Solis and Jose Rodriguez in the general election. There's just a lot that the city is, is in need of. Morrison won by about 70 votes. Yeah, a little tighter than we thought. And a lot of that was over those late votes. And uh, which those late votes, if you look, turned a lot of elections around all over the place. He says the task ahead won't be easy, but he's ready to address several issues the city is facing. I asked him about his plans to combat homelessness. He told me he's working to open a large shelter in the city and that the county should step up to provide more mental health and drug addiction services. That all comes under health and human services. Different levels of government are given different responsibilities and the money that goes with it. Well, guess who has the money and the responsibility for health and human services? It's the county, it's not the city. And we've got to really start pushing on the county. The county needs to do a lot more. I also asked him about crime in National City, which at one point was the highest in the county. Morrison says he'll combat the issue through policies he says worked during his previous tenure as mayor. As crime has increased before. I mean, we were the crime capital of the county, and that was one of the big things that I worked on when I was mayor before. And we worked for getting all of our departments together because it's not just a police issue. It's not all these. We pulled everyone, uh, everyone together, the community together. We pulled public works, we the parks department, library. Another controversial topic the low riding cruising ban. This last Tuesday, we uh, we had it on the agenda to, uh, to establish that this next year. We don't have all the details yet to basically do that as a city event. And so we want to have enough control so that there's not the traffic problems, there's not the crime problems, but everyone gets to enjoy the cars 
Morrison says the first order of business will be working with the council and says the hardest obstacle to tackle will be the division within his community. We're seeing that everywhere and that is really what is keeping I think a lot of our communities from making any real progress is all this division. Morrison is set to take office next Tuesday, December 13th. Rocio de la Fe, CBS 8. Rocio, thanks. And this week, another major milestone in LGBTQ rights. Crowds gathered in Hillcrest to celebrate the Respect for Marriage Act, which President Biden signed into law on Tuesday. It ensures that same-sex and interracial marriages are recognized in every state. LGBTQ leaders say it was critical to pass the Respect for Marriage Act quickly in case the Supreme Court were to decide to reverse its landmark ruling on marriage equality, much like Roe v. Wade was overturned earlier this year. When the Supreme Court wiped out a woman's right to choose, it was a wake-up call to the LGBTQ community that uh, our marriage equality protections were in grave danger. A recent Gallup poll finds that nationwide 71% of Americans support same-sex marriage, an all-time high. Back in 1996, when polling on this issue began, only 27% supported it. Meantime, San Diego City Council members have announced a resolution declaring San Diego a safe city for transgender, non-binary, and gender diverse youth. City Council members Marini, um, excuse me, Marnie Von Wilper and Stephen Whitburn made the announcement just earlier this week. They were joined by Trans Family Support Services and the Transgender Health and Wellness Center. Well, you know it by now, fans around the world are reeling after the unexpected death of DJ and dancer Steven Twitch Boss and how it happened. Twitch was widely known for his role as the dancing DJ on the Ellen DeGeneres show, his charisma and his larger than life personality, making his death all the more shocking. CBS 8's Steve Price reports. Thank you. He always seemed to be smiling. And having a great time. So tonight, sadness and shock that Stephen Boss, better known as Twitch, is dead. The L.A. County Coroner's Office says the former Ellen Show DJ died in a motel near his home from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Twitch was somebody known uh, to be so upbeat, so positive, so full of energy and, and, and life. Dr. Dan Reidenberg with Suicide Awareness Voices of Education says the problem is that depression can easily be hidden from family and friends. If somebody's walking around with a broken arm or a broken leg and they're on crutches, you can't cover that up. Um, with mental health challenges like depression, anxiety, uh, you can cover that up. Ah! Twitch, who was also a professional dancer, was just in San Diego a few years ago. He even taught CBS 8's Abby Alford a few moves. Because it kind of feels good to do. Ellen DeGeneres posted this on social media today. I'm heartbroken. Twitch was pure love and light. He was my family, and I loved him with all my heart. I will miss him. Please send your love and support to Allison and his beautiful children, Wesley, Maddox, and Zaya. You just get it there and then bring it back. It's just two to each side, really. With the holidays approaching and family gatherings taking place, suicide prevention experts say this is a good opportunity to really listen to others, pay attention for warning signs. People talking about having no sense of purpose, no, no reason to live anymore. Everybody would be better off without me. The number for the U.S. Suicide Prevention Hotline is 988. If you can't get the person you're concerned about to call, offer to call the number with them and stay by their side. Peace, everybody. Twitch was just 40 years old. Steve Price, CBS 8. Yeah, check in with each other. Take care of each other. That number again is 988. Well, you will soon be paying more for natural gas to fuel your home. SDG&E says wholesale costs for natural gas went up 19% between November and December. You'll see that price hike on your bill as your entire rate goes up. But the math is a bit more complex than that. And there are a few things that you can do to help keep your bill low. CBS 8's Jesse Pagan breaks it all down. After a year of ups and downs, the price of natural gas in the wholesale market reached a 14-year high in August. It came down slightly, and now SDG&E says it shot up 19% this month. The frustrating part is the wholesale market is responsible for uh, that price going up considerably, and we feel an obligation to tell our customer that this is happening so that they can plan accordingly. 
SDG&E communications manager Anthony Wagner says the company wants to get ahead of it this time to hopefully help you avoid a shock at your next bill. First, some background. Your gas rate is made up of three parts. The transportation and infrastructure costs SDG&E sets, the cost of public purpose programs everyone pitches into to help cover costs for people with low incomes, and the price of gas itself. While the first two have mostly stayed the same throughout the year, gas has been erratic. And that is the one part of your bill only the market can control. The geopolitical strife happening, uh, uh, absolutely dictates uh, the domestic market. Uh, I think competition around us is responsible for more demand, which uh, makes the price go up. That means the battle is mostly between you and the market. SDG&E says there's a few things, though, you can do off the bat. Caulk and weather strip around doors and windows with open spaces to keep heat where it's supposed to be. Keep your furnace clean. Change the filters once a month to keep it running efficiently. Do your laundry with cold water and take cooler showers, keeping your water heater around 120 degrees. I think it's safe to use the word unprecedented in that we saw a 19% jump in the overall rate. It wouldn't be outlandish to think that that runs in parallel from December to January and it be that much greater. Now, there are also assistance programs you can apply for to get discounts on your bill, get on a payment plan and more. Go to the help button on CBS8.com for those. And Wagner says that they expect some relief from the natural gas price roller coaster around February and March when demand then gets lower. Well, promising signs on the horizon for home buyers right now. Mortgage rates are down for the fifth straight week. The average 30-year fixed is now 6.31%. That's down two-tenths of a percent from last week. Still more than double what mortgage rates were a year ago, though, when they stood at 3.1%. Despite consecutive interest rate hikes from the Federal Reserve, mortgage rates have been falling recently, with analysts cautiously optimistic that inflation may have fallen finally peaked. Well, California will soon start forbidding the sale of flavored tobacco products after the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the ban on Monday. Big tobacco companies had turned to the courts after 63 percent of California voters backed the ban last month, which will include everything from candy flavored vape cartridges to menthol cigarettes. Some local smoke shops say this move could run them out of business, pointing out that in some cases flavored tobacco makes up 80 percent of their sales. But anti-tobacco advocates counter that this ban will help save lives in the long run. If we can stop the addiction now and prevent more young people from becoming addicted, then we certainly can prevent negative health impacts later in life for the next generation. Yeah, and this ban on flavored tobacco product sales will go into effect throughout California December 22nd. Well, now to a problem a lot of you have been telling us about for years that may finally be solved for some lucky San Diegans. CBS 8's Rocio De La Fe explains what's being done to bring peace and quiet to some Point Loma neighborhoods. Thousands of homes are sound insulated thanks to a quieter home program, giving thousands of homeowners most impacted the chance to enjoy their homes without the noise. Wendy Subiaga is one of the now 5,000 homeowners in San Diego who can sleep a little better at night. In 2021, her home in Point Loma received retrofitted exterior doors and windows to drown out the constant sound of airplanes that take off every few minutes. It isn't completely soundproof, but it has brought the noise level down considerably. Her home is just minutes away from the airport and even has a complete view of the runway from her bedroom window. After a while, you just get used to it. Uh, but I would say if it was a 7 out of 10 from an annoyance level, especially at 630 in the morning when they start taking off, I'd say it's down to a 1 or 2 out of 10. Like, I don't even hear it anymore. When an airplane goes by, you can hear it from inside the home, but it's not even loud enough for it to be picked up on the sound meter. But outside the house, it's a totally different story with sound levels measuring at more than 80. The sound insulation treatment aims to give those living in Bankers Hill, Point Loma, Ocean Beach, South Park, and Golden Hill a quieter place to live. 
The program began in 2001, and in 2021, it received grants totaling to almost $26 million from the FAA to continue expanding. This week, the program began work on non-residential properties, including a church and preschool. Really what this does is it allows people to the, enjoy the inside of their home without the pause when the aircraft fly over. John Anak is the program manager in the Planning and Environmental Affairs Department at the Airport Authority. She says having the airport located downtown does create challenges, but the program is always looking for solutions. Our communities, Bankers Hill, Point Loma, Ocean Beach, South Park, they're older, early 1900s older homes and that requires a unique approach. The program itself is at no cost to the homeowners because of the FAA grants. It ranks people based on the lengths of ownership of their home. Nack says she expects many more homes and non-residential buildings to be completed. To find out if your home may be eligible, we posted everything you need to know on our website cbsa.com. Just click the help button. Rocio de la Fe, CBS 8. Interesting, Rocio, thanks. Whew. Well, how about this one? San Diegans are reporting a major uptick in rats downtown. A local pest control company says several factors are contributing. For example, the winter months cause rodents to seek shelter in warm and dry places. Rats are also getting harder to get rid of as super toxic rat poisons are now banned in California. It's important to prep your home as well to stop them from coming in. Rodents can fit through very small openings. If it's bigger than a quarter, it's big enough for a rat. If it's bigger than a dime, it'll let a mouse in. So making sure that you, you plug those openings. Other things are uh, just making sure you like close your garage doors when it starts to get dark. A dime. Wow. He added that trash, dog or cat food and kernels from palm trees really attract the rodents. You can request a free inspection from the San Diego County Vector Program if you are concerned. Well, people in a military housing neighborhood reached out to us saying that there are vagrants living in a unit next door. Our Brian White has been working for you to get answers and has an update for us. I'm here near Murray Ridge Road in a Liberty Military Housing neighborhood where neighbors had reached out to us about a problem house just down the street here where they say four to five vagrants had moved in, were dealing drugs, and it had them all on edge. Now, I first reported this story on Monday, and the very next morning, that unit was vacated. It was like seeing somebody that I had actively saw on a mattress behind CVS go into a housing unit that's four doors down from me. It was like, whoa, what's What's going on? This active duty member of the U.S. Navy who wanted us to blur her face reached out to us for help. As she and other neighbors reported the problem over and over to Liberty Housing, their frustrations grew. Nothing's changing. Nothing's getting better. If anything, like it's, it's going downhill. You're taking $4,000 a month from me for this? You know, I, I've got people down the street living rent free and selling drugs. Neighbors told us the family that had been living there, including an active duty service member, apparently moved down in October and hadn't been seen around there since. That's when neighbors noticed a group of about five vagrants began staying there. Another neighbor I spoke with has two kids and she also wanted to remain anonymous. I'm obviously on edge at all times of, you know, the day, you know, in military housing, you're supposed to feel like you're, you know, you're somewhat safe. You know, I have two young kids and I don't want them to be exposed more to this. That day, I paid a visit to the Liberty Housing District office about the situation. And the very next morning, they took action. I saw the squatters moving out, packing boxes, putting them in the black truck. We were later notified that um, all the locks on the doors have been changed. With the unit cleared out, neighbors are resting easier and breathing a sigh of relief. It's nice that we, you know, can go outside, go out back. You know, my son, he feels safe now. And it's unfortunate that it had to get to this point but man, what impeccable timing that the story aired. And the next day, I mean, I guess some magic paperwork went through or something, you know? That was just such a relief, like I said, to, to have something actually done. Feel like a lot of neighbors are finally gonna be able to maybe sleep a little better at night. In Sarah Mesa, I'm working for you, Brian White, CBSA. Brian, truly thanks. Well, a local doctor charged with involuntary manslaughter is still practicing medicine in the South Bay. And despite the serious allegation against him, his medical license was just renewed. Steve Price has the latest on this case and also is working for you, looking into the system that keeps important information hidden from other patients. 
Dr. Carlos Chacon, the owner of Divino Plastic Surgery, is currently facing a charge of involuntary manslaughter because one of his patients died after surgery. The state's medical board says he committed repeated negligent acts, but he still has his license and he doesn't have to tell future patients that he's currently facing criminal charges. Megan Espinoza came to Davino in December of 2018 to have breast augmentation surgery. She was given anesthesia without a licensed anesthesiologist at the facility. According to legal documents, she became pulseless and suffered sudden cardiac arrest. Dr. Chacon started CPR, but Megan remained unconscious. Instead of calling 911, he called two anesthesiologists for advice. But according to the documents, he concealed from each anesthesiologist pertinent facts, including that patient A was comatose and suffered cardiac arrest. Finally, more than three hours after Megan's surgery took a horrific turn, the clinic called 911. Megan never regained consciousness and later died at the hospital. That's outrageous. Carmen Balber is very familiar with this case. As executive director of Consumer Watchdog, she works to improve patient safety. Patients should not have to fear that the doctor they're going to see whose record looks clean uh, is in fact a threat to their safety. So working for you, we asked Carmen how a patient can research their doctor's history. Unfortunately, current state laws are not on your side. Carmen says doctors are not required to tell patients if they're facing criminal charges for causing medical harm. And it can take years for the state medical board to complete an investigation, meaning the doctor can keep practicing medicine with no marks on their record. Californians should have the right to know if their doctor is currently under investigation for causing the death of another patient, for sexual misconduct with a patient, for causing serious lifelong harm, and we don't have that right. This past summer, three and a half years after Megan's death, the Accreditation Association for Ambulatory Healthcare revoked Davino's accreditation, meaning they can no longer do any surgeries that require anesthesia. But Davino's website still lists several procedures that require anesthesia. CBS 8 reached out to the clinic and Dr. Chacon's lawyers, but they did not respond to our request for a comment. Meanwhile, Dr. Chacon still has his medical license. In fact, it was just recently renewed for another two years. His preliminary hearing on the involuntary manslaughter charge is scheduled for March. Megan's family is also suing for civil damages and appears close to finalizing a $1 million settlement. In Bonita, Steve Price, CBS 8. Yeah, and don't forget here at CBS 8, we really are working for you. If there's something you'd like us to look into, email us at workingforyou at cbs8.com. Well, some pink, slimy little critters have been stirring up conversation on social media, and people at Coronado Beaches are asking, what are these things? So for this Earth 8 report, we sent our Brian White out looking for these so-called spoon worms and learn more about them from a local scientist. I'm here on Coronado Beach, south of Hotel Del, where people say they've been seeing these little wormy creatures all along the shoreline, so I'm gonna get out there and take a look. I haven't seen them yet. Are they moving? Debbie Rieger and I didn't have to go far to find these little critters scattered in the sand. They're kind of uh, slimy. You kind of don't want to touch them, but you do anyway. Uh, not going to eat one. These wormy creatures have been causing quite a stir on Coronado Facebook groups with posts like this one. I'm excited that people are excited about worms. Charlotte Seed is a museum scientist at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and she's the manager of the Benthic Invertebrate Collection, or bottom-dwelling spineless animals, and they have over 800,000 specimens cataloged. Right here, we actually have a preserved specimen of the animals that caused such a sensation on the beach. These are spoonworms. They are relatives of earthworms, except they live under the waves and they burrow into the sand rather than in your garden. So I asked her why they're showing up all of a sudden on Coronado beaches. Unfortunately, with all that wave action, they were probably dislodged from their homes. Uh, they got tumbled around and ended up where we can see them above the water. This is video of a spoonworm at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Scientifically, they're called Eurekis capo, but a common name is the fat innkeeper worm because other small animals like little worms and crabs like to take refuge in their burrows too. And turns out they're pretty good stewards 
lords of the environment. They are eating sediment, they're cleaning that water, everything that comes through their burrows, so that may seem yucky to us, but it's delicious to them and they're doing us and the environment a favor. Rumor has it they're edible, not necessarily for us humans. Leopard sharks, however, find them a tasty snack. I'm not going there. <laughs> You're not going to give it a try? No, as darling as they may be. <laughs> In Coronado, Brian White, CBS 8. Interesting. Now we know, right? Uh, this is amazing. The Orion capsule made its way to San Diego on Tuesday after its mission to space. It was brought back on board the Navy's USS Portland. During re-entry, it endured temperatures of 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It reached speeds of 25,000 miles per hour. But over a 20-minute span, it then slowed down to just 20 miles an hour before splashing down right off of our coast in Baja, California. Seeing it come out of the sky with the parachutes as it broke through the clouds, hearing the sonic boom, I was almost shaking. I was so excited to be a part of this. Yeah, it's history. So it is now headed for the Kennedy Space Center where NASA engineers will pull flight data to prepare for the Artemis II mission in 2024. We leave you now with this so sweet a holiday tradition continued this week at Rady Children's Hospital. The Light the Way Parade of Lights is a way to bring joy and fun to young patients who are having to spend their holiday season there at the hospital. This is the fifth year that we've done this and it's really a spectacular, you know, unique event. And it's just really nice to give back to the folks that are having a hard time here at Children's Hospital. Oh, so sweet. So if you are interested in donating to Rady Children's Hospital, you can head to CBS8.com and click on that help button. Well, as always, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for staying informed. Join me each week as I take you around San Diego. For CBS8, I'm Jenny Day. Take good care of yourself.